don't you go ahead and stand? If this is your first time with, with us, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord? Who's excited? Sounds like, sounds like her a little sleepy. <laughs> it's okay. I was tired before I got here. Um, all right. So before we begin, why don't you go ahead and greet someone that's near you? Spread some love around the room. If you're comfortable, you can shake a hand or you can do a fist bump or you can just do a wave from your seat. That's fine too.
we believe that this morning? Come on, let's stir up our faith, Father. Fill us with faith, Lord God. Fill us with your spirit, God. Fill us with faith. I raise the hallelujah. Come on, sing it out. In the presence of my enemies.
all of our praise. Father, we just give it all to you this morning. We're just so thankful for who you are in our lives, Lord, for giving us everything that we need. And it's you, God. You are who we need. Who am I that the highest king would well?
chosen. I am chosen. I am chosen. Come on, sing it out. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, Lord, thank you. nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare you are living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen from the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come love
what this place Come and on, fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Oh, sing it again. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come for your presence. Lord, we thank you that your presence is a tangible thing, Father God, that we can actually feel you and feel you moving in the room. And this might be the first time that some of you have felt the spirit of the Lord. You might not know what it is, but it is him. And he shows up. When we cry out, he shows up. We love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Come on, just thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for providing everything that we need. And that's you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You can go ahead and have a seat. Let's just keep our hearts postured for worship. We're going to go into our tithes and offering time. But remember, this is part of our worship part of a way that we can worship the Lord with our finances, something that we put a lot of trust in. But let's put our trust in the Lord, amen? All right, so I have a verse to share with you. It's from 1 Chronicles 29, 16. It says, everything comes from you, and we have only given you what comes from your hand. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with our integrity. All these things I give willingly and with honest intent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you with open hands. We thank you for providing for us, Lord. We thank you that we can trust you with everything that we have, everything that you have given us. We trust you with it. We love you and we worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's continue to worship.
Good morning, church. Thank you so much for spending this Sunday morning with us. Can we just give the worship team a round of applause? They were beyond amazing this morning. Um, my name is Jessica. I'm the Connections Director here. I just wanted to welcome you guys. Um, if you are new here, I want to give you a special welcome. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. There is a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, I would love to get to know your name and your story, and the only way I can do that is if you fill one of those out and I can connect with you during the week. If you fill one of those out, you can take it out into the lobby. There's a um, guest relations, it's that circle um, desk that you saw when you walked in. You could drop it off with one of those wonderful people there, or if you don't wanna talk to anyone, you could drop it in the black box out by the doors when you're walking out that says tithe and offering. I will get it and I will try to contact you this week and just get to know you and see how I can connect you here at the church. Um, so the one thing I wanted to tell you guys and kind of give you guys a round of applause is we had food room on Friday and we did amazing. We had 11 families come, <coughs> excuse me. We had 11 families come get food. But the amazing thing is, I mean, that's awesome. The amazing thing is as a church, you guys provided enough that we didn't have to go out and buy more food. We were able to, yeah, that's awesome. We were able to provide enough food for those 11 families just by your guys' generosity and your donations. I just wanna say thank you. That is so awesome that you guys are able to do that for not just us as a church, but just the community. They can come by and know that we can have, help them and give them food. So I wanna thank you guys for that. Students, you guys are dismissed. If you are new and you wanna to go to um, service with the students, just go out in the lobby, they will meet you out there. Um, I think that um, we are just growing so much as a church. And I just wanna thank you guys for your generosity and just being here and showing up every day and just the clothes that are in the lobby, that's awesome for our clothing drive. So I just wanted to thank you guys for everything that you've done and stepping up for generosity. I'm gonna pray for our hearts to get prepared for the message as Pastor Dan comes up and uh, leads us in, in our message today. So if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me tonight, I mean this morning. Definitely Father, I just thank you Lord for um, just this time that we can get together, Lord, and just prepare our hearts to hear this message, Lord. And I just pray that you can just put on us the need to just take this message, marinate it in it, Lord, and just spread it throughout our community. Lord, I just pray for the Holy Spirit to speak through Dan and that you just open our, our hearts and our minds and our ears just to hear the, the Holy Spirit speaking through Dan in this message today, Lord. I just ask that you just bless everyone that's in this room, Lord. And I just thank you so much for today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. So uh, this being Memorial Day weekend, I thought it would be good for us to start with um, just understanding Memorial Day is, is, is something that we do as a nation. And, and we have, you know, a long weekend and all that. But... It's meant to remember and mourn those who gave their lives in defense of this country. And the Bible says to give honor where honor is due. So if you join me with a moment of silence, just thank, during that silence, thank God for that, for the freedoms that we have and, and the context we get to live in. But um, at the end of that, I'll, I'll close with a prayer. So let's join me in a, in a moment of silence. Heavenly Father, we know that your word says that there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. That verse rings so true in the spirit of this holiday weekend. And I'm just so grateful um, for that sacrifice of so many people and generations um, so we can live in the place of opportunity. Help us never to take that for granted. In your name we praise you. Amen. Um, I also want to talk about a little bit you know, just the tragedy we saw at Robb Elementary this week. And I think it's important as a church to understand something. Because you, you watch the news sometimes and you see these things that happen. You got, you know, 
war in Ukraine, you have that going on, we've had COVID for two years, we have had consistent challenges that just seem global, and they seem like they're almost like on a cycle, like they're just going to keep happening, what's the, what's the next thing, and, and just remembering and, and understanding um, that tragedy is real, we live in a fallen world, and we as a church, as everybody kind of clamors, I was listening to the news and stuff, you just hear all this, these people, are, when they see injustice, which is a good thing, to see injustice and want an answer and a solution. But I watch so many people kind of clamoring for a solution. And grief and fear and anger almost never comes up with good solutions, right? But that's why we have a role as a church. And in and, and a nation where uh, maybe the church has been on the decline. And, and we begin to wonder why these things happen. These things are going to happen. They've been happening since um, Cain and Abel, right? But God has a plan and he has a church and a body and his bride of, his, of Christ that's supposed to come out and, and, and be the light. And so today, I just, I, I really feel like, you know, there's people that say, oh, thoughts and prayers. Don't send thoughts and prayers. We need solutions. They don't understand prayer, do they? So I would like to pray today for those families affected. Just thinking about, I saw pictures of those kids and just thinking about the lives that were forever changed by what happened. So I just, I just want to pray right now and pray for those families. God, I just lift up those families in that community affected by that tragedy this week. Our hearts are broken, and we're reminded of how broken this world is. Thank you for giving us hope and peace in you, and I pray that you comfort those affected, and I pray that the churches in the area can bring your hope and peace to that community. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Prayer works. I'm reminded more and more in my prayer journal how often when I pray, I forget to go back, and then I'll go back to write something new, and I'll glance up on my prayer journal, and, and I have to mark answered. Like God sees, he cares, and he listens. And the prayers of his people, he listens. And so I don't ever want to get to the point where we get callous of heart, where we see things happen, and it's just another news story. And I never want to get to the point where we don't believe that prayer works. God works in his timing. And I think it's important as a church that we, we remember that. And, and so I'm excited. Actually, we planned this series, you know, weeks and weeks ago. And, and the, the book of Ephesians, a study in Ephesians. And we're gonna, there's six chapters. We're going to go over it for the next six weeks. But what's great is, you know, we, we've not had a couple years without uncertain moments. And understanding the role of the church, and since we're on this shared journey together, I thought it'd be good to cast some vision about what a church is meant to be based on the source material. And I don't know if you know this, but the, the church of Ephesus was a very prominent place in the early church. And, and they got lots of good teachers, the Apostle Paul, Timothy, the Apostle John. They had tons of great theologians go through there. And so when we look at the, the original vision for the church, you get some really great instruction in Ephesians 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And we'll spend that time there. But I think it's important for us to take the world and see the role of the church and understand that we can take the world and, and look at it in two ways. The first way is to look at the world and say, hey, as we read God's word, the world's not lining up. And a lot of people tend to see the world as it should be. And then that leads to a really dark, disappointing day. Because we see the world is not loving like God says. The world is not all these things. And you say, you know, what is that about? But the point is we could look and look at it a different way and see, see the world as it is, as a fallen world. And that we could be a church that's a part of the solution to make it as it should be. The whole point of the gospel is to restore, renew, and bring back what God intended. And so I think today, really starting in the first chapter, we get a chance to see that if we take the gospel and we use it as a lens to see everything else, no matter what the world throws at us, we're going to have solutions. You know, I think about uh, missionaries who go into the darkest places of the world to bring the gospel, right? And slowly, I think some of us are starting to think, man, America's starting to feel that way. But they talk about how when they, they, they fly in and they can almost, as the plane descends, feel the darkness of these, of these nations. And then when they land, it's just, it's not anything they're comfortable with. The spirit, their spirits almost grieve seeing the abject poverty and the exploitation and all the things that are going on. 
and you haven't been outside of America, you, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. That's the best thing of a mission trip is to go actually witness what a lot of people outside of our context experience every single day. But what they say is, what's always interesting to me is when they do get to the church, that it's this bright beacon of hope and it's palpable. It's not that it's glowing bright, it feels bright. It has the hope that is nowhere else in that country. And so understanding that's the role of the church in these dark times is to be the light, to pass it forward. Our solution, you know, you can lean on government, you can lean on all these policies and things like that. Those are important. But there's nothing like Christ in us going out and being the light and understanding and helping God change hearts by, by presenting the gospel where the gospel's needed. And so when we look at um, the church in Ephesus and we look at this, this letter, the epistle, when you see in your Bible, if you're new um, to Christianity or anything, the word epistle means letter. So what was going on is Paul, he was, he was a, an apostle, a teacher, a, a leader, a founder of the church, where he was able to write letters to churches to help them become churches. Nobody had done this before. They were, they were walking away, and we're, talk, we're going to talk about this in, in the coming weeks. They were walking away from a religious tradition that was dead. And they were trying to bring something new, something alive. Um, all through uh, the book of Ephesians, we see this word mystery. And we're going to talk about what that mystery was. But that mystery was us. And so Paul is saying the mystery is the church. The church is the plan. The plan to meet the needs of the world on Jesus' behalf. And so... If you turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, just to get an overview, the first three chapters of, of, of this book goes over the call of the church. Who are we supposed to be? What are we supposed to do? Doctrinally, scripturally, what was the plan from the beginning? What does God say? Who's the church supposed to be? All of us have grown up with, with traditions that we grew up in, and that's what a church means to us. But what a church is, it doesn't change. And the source material, the Bible, defines what a church is supposed to be. And that's what we're going to dive in today and over the next two weeks. The chapters 4, 5, and 6 get really practical. It's the conduct of the church. From In chapter 4, it's one of my favorite chapters. I can't wait. That's going to be on Father's Day. I get, I get to preach one of my favorite passages of Scripture on Father's Day. I can't wait. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's important because I always say, you take Matthew 20, 28 which is a great commission, and then you fulfill it by being Ephesians 4 so that we can have Revelation 7. So that if you, that's kind of the Bible signed up, uh, summed up for me. So we're going to get to Ephesians 4 where we have some individual um, conduct and lessons there, which is really awesome. And then we get into some family and relational conduct, and then we get into some spiritual um, conduct when we talk about the armor of God in, in chapter 6. So can't wait for that. But today we're doing chapter 1. So if you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 1, we get to see who this is from and who this is for. So Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, the saints, it also could be translated as holy ones. And so when you talk about holy ones, it's not people, a lot of people hear the word holy and it's kind of intimidating because they're like, oh, I got to be perfect. No, we're holy because Jesus was perfect, not because of what we do. So that's why we get to be called saints. And so he's talking about the, the Christians, the saints, the holy ones, those set apart to worship God. That's all that means. Set apart. You're going to be sacred. You're not going to be part of the normal group. You're going to be over here, and you're going to be my people. That's what saints mean, sanctified. And so the saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So they're saints, and it's very specific, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. You hear a lot of things today about identity. And I love Ephesians chapter 1 because we're going to talk about our identity in Christ as a church and as saints, children of God, Christians, whatever you want to call it. It's our identity in Christ. In Christ is mentioned 12 times in this chapter. Who are we in Christ? Because all of us are a lot of things not in Christ. I got a whole bunch of stuff, and not a lot of it's good. But when we're in Christ, it's different. And so that's the thing about it. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called, right? He's bringing 
us together as a church to send us to do his work. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next couple weeks. But who is this to? This is Paul the Apostle, who before he was an apostle, he had a different name. His name was Saul. And if you're new, he was kind of the Darth Vader of his day. Okay? So he was the guy that would go around and he was hunting down Christians because they were not lining up with the current religious leaders. And Jesus came along and said, hey, why are you persecuting me? Why are you chasing me down? And it was on a road to Damascus where he was on, he was on a mission to go get a bunch of Christians. And Jesus stopped him and changed his life forever, called him to him. And eventually he accepts Christ and he goes from Saul to Paul. And he becomes called to be the preacher to the Gentiles. And so this whole book talks about how God planned to bring the Gentiles in with the Jewish people to be something that's called a mystery to most in the Old Testament and up till that moment. But he chose Paul to bring the reality of, hey, the Gentiles are going to be a part of this, and it's going to be called a church. This is my plan. So the Apostle Paul, who is he? That's who's writing this letter. And he writes this letter, by the will of God, to the Christians who are faithful. The Christians who are faithful, the saints who are faithful, the people who say, I identify with Christ. Because in that day, you had lots of things you could identify with. A lot of people, we today, we identify with a lot of things. You hear a lot of stuff in the news about how people are identifying. But besides all that, a lot of us, if you're a guy, you can identify with your work. And say, everything I do is through the lens of how do I do a good job. How, do I, how, how can I provide for my family? Which sounds very noble and it's very good. But when you identify with your work, what happens when your work gets taken from you? When you identify with your work, what hap- does that make you a better father? Does that make you a better friend? Sometimes women will identify with the role of mother or family or just being a woman. And does that make you better? Or maybe you identify with a certain sports team. You know, that's just how you're going to be. Maybe you're a Raider fan and everyone else is going to judge you for that. But if you identify with a certain political party, which, by the way, is okay, but let me ask you this, does it make you better? When we identify in Christ, we become saints. We become sanctified. We become better at all those other things. When you identify in Christ, I, be a, I become a better employee. When I identify in Christ, I become a better father. When I identify with Christ, I become better at everything I do versus trying to make everything I do line up with the Bible. No, I look through the lens of the gospel, and then everything goes through there. That's what the church is for. These are the faithful in Christ. They don't let anything else squeeze that out. It's how that works. And so when we look at the faithful, they're saying these are the people who identify in Christ. Faithful people identify with their example. And so Ephesians uh, uh, 1 verse 2 says, grace to you and peace from from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our peace, just so you know, our peace is a result of God's grace through Jesus. And our peace is our way back to him. Prior to Jesus' sacrifice, there was a lot of religion that had to go to bring peace between man and God because of sin. And so who we are, why we even get to be faithful, is God's grace through Jesus so that we can have that peace. And Paul does that as a reminder in his greetings. A lot of times we'll start reading these books of the Bible and we'll pass over these really rich moments to never forget. Paul writes that as a reminder, knowing as human beings we need to be reminded. Ephesians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What are those spiritual blessings? This is where it gets real good. As you see words like blessing, spiritual blessing, and you can read over those and not really understand what he's saying, but the following verses will describe all the blessings. He starts to describe it. This is not the greeting. This is Blessed be our God who gave us all these things. He's reminding it. And he says this in verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. 
in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. That's blessing number one. The Father chose us. This is the beginning of the gospel. If you think about this, the Father chose us. That's the blessing. The Father picked to know. He foreknew that things were going to go the way they did. And he chose a way back. We're never more like God than, we let, than when we allow for someone to have a way back to us that's been estranged from us. And God chose that. When you think of John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that's what this is. You talk about these spiritual blessings, that's a spiritual blessing. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that there would be a way back. And so that first spiritual blessing is that we're chosen. We're picked. Now, there's some debate on who's chosen, and, you know, those usually lead to some fruitless conversations. What we're going to focus on today is what most people agree is, what did he choose? And that's the path back. God chose us. To, have an adop- to be able to be redeemed, to be able to be adopted, to be able to be back in his family. And so that's a big point to understand that the first blessing is the Father chose us. Ephesians 1, 6 through 7 says this, To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in his beloved, that's Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That's the second blessing. Talk about these spiritual blessings that Paul's praising God for. First one, the Father chose us. The second, Jesus died for us so that we can have forgiveness, so we can get on that path back. So he chose the path back, we get to be on that path back. Do you guys sense where we're going here? This is the gospel. The spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, it's the gospel. And so you have the Father, you have the Son. What's next? The Holy Spirit. And we're going to read on. Ephesians 1, 8 through 9, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, and he made us to know the mystery of his will. And we'll get to that mystery next week. According to his kind intention, which he proposed in him, or purposed in him. So we get our purpose in Christ. Ephesians 1, 10, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth, verse 11, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we were, that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. The whole idea that God chose us provided a path back so that we can have an inheritance. Understand what that word inheritance is. You know, it's the idea of heritage. If you go and Google heritage, the first thing that pops up is Ancestry.com. So if you want to say that we're given an inheritance, we're going to get into that family tree of God because of what he chose, because of what Jesus did. And so understanding that Paul is reminding the church in Ephesus, I want you to know who you are. God chose you. God died for you. He wanted you back so bad that he did that. So understand what's different. What makes you set apart is that you were picked, you were chosen to have a way back. And so we go through this and we start to understand that time and truth go hand in hand. And Paul is showing the early church that God always intended to work through his people through the church. God had a plan and he did not reveal it until the time of Jesus. But Ephesians 1.13 says this, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, so he's referring to all these things that we're talking about. He names it as the gospel here. It says the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance and with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Two things. This is the third blessing. So you have the choice of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, the seal of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be sealed? Um, When we talk about Ancestry.com, you have families, you have family heritage, you have family identifications. When you're sealed, that means there's a mark that sets you apart. When we're given the Holy Spirit, God intended that Holy Spirit in us, that wisdom, that connection to him, to mark us 
as children of God. That's what it means to be sealed. It's almost like, you know, you know my brother-in-law is a, a dairy farmer. I don't think they do this anymore, but they used to brand the cows so that if they ever wandered off, people would know which is which. And so when God marks us with the Holy Spirit, he seals us the Holy Spirit. He's saying, that one's mine. And we talk about baptism. Today I got to baptize Mark. Congratulations, by the way. But you get sealed. You get set apart. That's, that's an idea of God saying, as he comes up out of the water, he's like, that one's mine. Who are we in Christ? We're a church. We're a body, a gathering of people who have heard the gospel, listened to the gospel, believed the gospel, received the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the second thing I want to talk about, the promise. As I grow in my faith and look over the years since I've become a Christian and understanding when to pray and when not to pray, I, I, I remember early in my faith, I prayed for everything. I, you know, just thinking about it and, and just that became a good, a good response. And it is a good response. But I've learned there's times when you don't have to pray. It's when God promises something. When God promises something, you just have to walk into that promise. And so God sealed us with a Holy Spirit of promise that we would have an inheritance in him. That we can walk as God's children. So we can identify ourselves as part of his family. And so who is the church? What are we? We're a bunch of people marked for God with a purpose. To be in this world. To understand what it is to do what he wants us to do. When I get filled with the Holy Spirit, I become a child of God. People often say this because I, I can get pretty confident. And if I'm good at something, I know I'm good at Like I talk about cooking and I'll eat something. I'm like, man, I'm good at that. That's really good. But people are like, man... Sometimes people get confused and they're like, well, aren't you supposed to be humble? It's like, no, it's an accurate view of yourself. There's lots of things I'm not good at. But if I'm good at something, I, like, I don't want to pretend like I'm not good at it in the name of humility. That's false humility. But a lot of times people say, well, who do you think you are that you can even try something like that? And it's like, oh, you forget who I am. I'm like, who's that? Child of the living God. That's who we are. When God opens doors, we can walk through with confidence because we're sealed with a promise that we're his children doing his work. And a lot of times Christians tremble in fear because they don't feel qualified. No, you don't have to be. You're sealed with a promise. Walk into it. Be who you need to be in your circle of influence, the family, the friends, the people you come in contact with every day. You have a promise from God that he's going to be there with you even to the end of the age. And he sealed you with the Holy Spirit just in case you don't know what to say. He's going to help. I've had moments where I've had friends around and I said something really profound. They're like, yeah, that wasn't you. That was the Holy Spirit all the way. I'm like, yeah, I think you're right because I did not think to say that. Those things happen when we walk closely with him. When we decide to walk as children of promise. Ephesians 1.14 says he was given a pledge of our inheritance. This is just the beginning. It's the start. And so with a view of redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. It's not for us. That's who the church is. We get to glorify him all the time. That's why Christians say praise God. That's why when we do things and things happen, it's for his glory. The Holy Spirit fills us with wisdom. But when we believe that wisdom becomes the seal. That wisdom, that connection to the Lord, which we're going to talk a lot about in chapter 3. The closeness we have to the Lord. It gets noticed that we're part of God's family and part of God's kingdom. We, we tend to stand out. We have a piece about us that looks different than the rest of everybody. As Christians, we've got to do our best to represent Christ. And that doesn't mean being offended by things that don't match up with his word. It means being a solution with God to make sure that happens. So there's a difference in life and the way we take uh, the world in. But a seal is a distinguishing mark, one that says, that's mine. Our spiritual blessings are found in this, in the work of the Trinity. You have the Father's choice to redeem us. You have Jesus' sacrifice that did redeem us. And you have the Holy Spirit that seals us to show us that there is promise in what's been done. And so I think that's something to understand, that, that work of the, of the Trinity. If people say, well, the Trinity's not mentioned in the Bible, it's like, I would send them straight to Ephesians chapter 1. It's a really good example of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's when we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
It's the work of the Trinity that brought you to that point. And so understanding that our spiritual blessing in, spirit, in heavenly places is the gospel being realized in our lives and through our lives. The work of this Trinity, chosen, redeemed, sealed, were marked. When we accept the gospel or work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we now identify ourselves with the family and kingdom of God. So moving on to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Paul talks about this. So now that he's presented the gospel, he's, he's presented who we are in Christ, he says some interesting things. He says this, For this reason I too have heard of the, of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. Do not cease giving thanks for you. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So Paul's mentioning all these things that happen because of the gospel. And he says, hey, look, I've heard about your faith, and I just praise God for it. I think a lot of times the faithful in Christ are overlooked and taken for granted. A lot of you guys in here, thinking about this, that we didn't have to go buy food for the food room. 11 families ate because of your generosity. That's a great example. People are hearing about Christ. People got invited to Easter. There's little things. It's just the beginning. But to understand that I don't take your faith for granted. In fact, I take it on as a, as a huge responsibility to steward it and help you get a little better each day. So someday you're going to help someone else get a little better each day who's in your circle. We gather here so that we can scatter and bring, bring the light of Christ to the world. And so understanding that as a church, who are we? We're not a church that just comes and sings songs and listens to me talk. Believe me, there's better people on YouTube. But what we're going to do is we're going to come together as a shared journey to find out what God wants for this church in this place specifically. And so the, the, just like Ephesians, the Ephesian church, they had a very specific role in the early church and in Asia. We have a very specific role in our day and time. God chose each one of us. He didn't just choose a way back. He chose the time and the place we would live. And somehow we found ourselves together as a church for a reason and a purpose. And so I, I feel that way because I feel like I started praying. And this isn't how it happens, just how it feels. I started praying in Houston. God, what's next for me? And I opened my eyes and here I was because I can't explain it. It had to be God. And so here we are, and that's probably similar to you. You don't know why you got here or how you got here. In fact, when I have dinner and lunch with you guys, I, that's one of my favorite questions to ask. I'm going to ask it today. I'm, I'm meeting with a family today. How did you come to VBCC? How did God bring you here? Because that's part of the story. Because God's bringing you here for a purpose so that you can go out and bring someone else. And when you hear that story, that's the idea of bringing people in the kingdom and family of God. That's the role of the church. Ephesians 1.17 says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom, of revelation, and the knowledge of him. Paul's praying this for the church. He says this, and, and he says that he prays specifically for the early church. He listens. We need to listen carefully to what Paul asks on behalf of the church, and that continues in, verse, in the next verses. He says this, so if Paul's praying for the church, what does Paul want the church to do? This is the early church, so we can say, God probably was speaking through Paul, and the reason this made it into Scripture, so that we can reference it. And there's nothing very specific about Ephesus here, so there's some general things here that every church needs to hear. So listen, listen to this, Paul's prayer points. Which he, so this is what Paul prayed, which he brought in, about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul's prayer points was this, that he asked for a spirit of wisdom that reveals Christ. So a spirit of wisdom that reveals Christ, not just to us, but that we would also reveal Christ to other people. That's who we are in Christ. We're people who identify with Christ because Christ's been revealed to us, and in turn, we would reveal that to other people. He prays for an enlightened heart to grasp the hope in our calling as a church. Sometimes people could go to church and they don't know why they go to church, they just go to church. When we identify in Christ, we understand why we go to church. It's the hope of our calling. There's hope in our calling. He prays also that we understand the richness of our inheritance. 
Paul's prayer points to the church. Knowing the greatness of God's power toward us is the same power that raised Jesus and seated him in all authority. That word seated, God put him there. But because we have a heritage and inheritance with Jesus, we're there too. And that power that put Jesus, took Jesus from the grave to that point works through us. So that, this is the next point, we understand that we are the body of Christ. We have power in us so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus to the rest of the world. As a church, who are we going to identify as or in? In Jesus. You identify with your example. If you're watching the news, if you're watching TikTok, if you're watching all the things, nope, let's look at Ephesians. Let's start there. We can watch all that other stuff, but if we look at it through this lens, we'll be much better at it. And I think that's the thing that Jesus wants us to do when he mentions in Christ 12 times in the first chapter to this church. I think we're supposed to find our identity in him. Those 12 times says this, we're, we, we're it faithful in Christ, meaning we're reliable to follow him. We're, we're spiritually blessed in Christ, chosen in Christ, adopted in Christ, redeemed in Christ. That word redeemed, when there was a problem between us and God, that word redeem means released. So in Christ, there's no problem with God. In Christ, we find purpose. In Christ, we have, check this out, we have a heavenly view of our times. We understand what is going on. From the, from the beginning of the world, when we start reading in Genesis, we, we're not surprised that this, these things are happening. Jesus promised us, in this world, you will have tribulation. But don't worry, I've overcome the world. How did we do that? In Christ, as his church, we will overcome with him. In Christ, we're given a heritage. In Christ, we're given hope. In Christ, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of wisdom and promise. And in Christ, we are the hands and feet of Christ. I don't want us to forget that. As we go through this series, we're going to talk next week about what it means to be alive in Christ. To understand what it means to be close to God because we're alive in Christ. It's such an important chapter. And, and, and the, again, the, the verses and, and chapters are not inspired. So it's all one thing. So we're, just, we're dividing them up week by week. But what I don't want you to miss today is who are you in Christ? We're chosen. We're redeemed. We're sealed with promise. We're given purpose. Been praying a lot, and we're going to hear a lot more. But in in the fall, we're going to have our, our marching orders from the Lord. I'm pretty sure of it. And we're going to talk about what we're going to do over the next couple years in Christ to fulfill this purpose, to look through the gospel lens. I want to be a gospel-driven church because that's what I think Ephesians chapter one is saying. But let's go ahead and end today before we take communion. And pray the prayer that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. So pray with me today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to say we are in Christ as a church. I thank you for every person in this room that you have drawn here by your spirit. I pray for us as a church that we begin to look up and see with your eyes, to think with your mind to walk with your feet and to help with your hands. I pray for a spirit of wisdom that just reveals you to this region, to the people that are hurting, to the people that don't even know what they're missing. Help us to have a spirit of wisdom about that. Enlighten our heart to understand what's at stake and the hope of our calling. Help us to understand the richness of being a part of your family. Help us to understand the power that raised Christ from the dead, that seated him in the heavenly places, is the same power that allows us to be your hands and feet. Help us to walk in the confidence that only a child of God could walk. Help, help us to be a church that makes you smile, a church that is your desire help us to understand how much you love us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. 
At this time, we're gonna enter into a moment of communion. And as we do, the cups are gonna be passed. And I just wanna remind you that the top cup has juice and the bottom cup has a cracker. If you get them mixed up, you're gonna have to change your pants when you go home today. So make sure you don't get those two things mixed up, okay? Um, also, in just a moment, there's gonna be um, some people on the sides of the stage here ready to pray for you. And uh, if you need prayer for anything, anything at all, if you, if you don't know Christ, if you want to know more about him, if you're struggling with something, I encourage you, please, don't hesitate. Seek out that prayer. Um, prayer is very powerful, and uh, it's something that we want to be about here at Ridge Valley Christian Church. Um, I just want to circle back real quick on, on something Dan brought up in Ephesians. Uh, it's Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. When we believe, we are marked, we are branded by God and he claims ownership over us and that's proven through his Holy Spirit. And that inheritance we receive is amazing. It's the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. It means that we inherit um, forgiveness of our sins, connection to God. It means that we are chosen, we are not forsaken, and we are who, we, who he says we are. So as we go into communion today, I just, I encourage you, please pray, ask God who you are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, and thank you for the cross. I thank you for marking us as your sons and daughters, and I pray that we are filled with your spirit, and I pray that we are filled with your spirit of wisdom, that our spiritual eyes will be open to you, and I pray that you reveal to us who we are in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand? Let's just declare this over our lives again, who, who we are in Christ. Amen. 
So we just step into that this week. We just go back to your word, Father God, this week. We go back to it. We go back to it. We go back to it. We're going to keep your word in our minds, Lord God, because your word that is going to transform our minds. We believe what you have said today, and we claim it. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. All right, you guys have a great week.